Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this Autism Hangout feature program series, Ask Dr. Tony, where once again we get to sit down with everybody's favorite expert on Asperger's <laughs> and autism, Dr. Tony Atwood. I'm starting to feel like a game show barker. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll hire you as my public relations consultant here <laughs> with, with these wonderful send-ups. Well, yeah. you've just finished another long day of discussion, and I want to thank you for, for taking time out from your, uh, your presentations today to talk and answer the questions from Autism Hangout. We have a few in here from YouTube as well, but as usual, they're covering the whole gamut mm -hmm. that's involved with Asperger's and autism. So should we just jump in? Yeah, thanks, Craig. I think this is so important that um, there are many things that I want to get across and answer these very, very very important questions. Excellent. The first one is, uh, is from Ivo. He is so fascinated by the whole spectrum of different personalities or traits or characteristics of people with Asperger's. For instance, some can stand heat, some can't stand heat, some like cold, some can't stand cold. It goes the same thing with loud and soft. It's, it goes this way with touch and no touch. His question, which was one of kind of more of a special interest, is are there four or five traits typical of people with Asperger's that run this gamut of the spectrum one into the other? A very good question. In fact, it's, it's on many dimensions. I mean, if we take the sensory one, you get in the new diagnostic criteria in DSM-5, hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so the hypersensitivity may be to certain sounds, but certain sounds you hardly hear. There may be a lack of sensation to touch, but then on some occasions there may be a light touch which is viewed as very painful. And this is the same person? Yes, yes. So you can get that inconsistency across the sensory dimensions of sensory sensitivity and a lack of sensitivity. Hmm. But it also occurs at the two extremes in other dimensions. So when you've got the social dimension of social confusion, mm -hmm. you can go down either of two paths. One is to become shy and introverted and very cautious in social situations and you, you sort of pull back. But others will do the opposite and be too intense and intrusive. So the criticism may be you need to come out of yourself more, whereas others is the criticism is you're too intense in what you do. So you can get the two extremes. Mm -hmm. um, it can be in number skills. You can get some who are phenomenal with numbers, fantastic, and others just haven't a clue with numbers. There are some that are fascinated by reading and as young are hyperlexic, and yet there are others who are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. So what you've got in, in ASD is a condition that's very heterogeneous and many extremes. There's normally what we call a normal distribution, very few at the extremes. Mm -hmm. Within ASD, you get many at the two extremes of ability. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely phrase, I didn't invent it. When you've met a person with Asperger's, you've met one person with Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And the heterogeneity and variety of expression, I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is that so many people on the spectrum are now discovering that about themselves. And in this diversity, there is just so much opportunity, not only for hope, but for education for people at the same time. Yes. Um, I did read the other day where the occurrence of savant syndrome in people on the spectrum is one out of 10. Mm. Is, is, is that what you've read as well? Is yes, that... it's been known for some time. Um, that means nine out of 10 aren't. Uh, yeah. But it means that when you've got Asperger's syndrome and you've got the savant char savant characteristics and high IQ, you've got genius level at whatever it is. And so what I'm trying to encourage people is if they've got it, use it, flaunt it, develop it, because we're going to benefit from it, whether it be art, whether it be music, composition, etc., whether it's in science and information technology and designing new uh, technological equipment. It's finding what that is and then developing that person's skill for a sense of self-identity and self-worth. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is pursue your passion. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, spoken by somebody who's very passionate about Asperger's. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Okay, this second question is from Aspie PT, and it's along the same uh, characteristics of sensory issues. Um, he is frightened by flashing lights and loud noises, uh, but he's also discovered something else. This is his questions. Uh, question, things like closing the last door in a car after entering it, mm -hmm. or closing the last window in the car if the car is moving, or being in a train if it's entering or exiting tunnels. I feel pressure changes very strongly, mm -hmm. and it's unpleasant to the point that it makes me cringe, even while everyone else doesn't seem to mind. Is this typical of somebody with Asperger's? Yes, indeed it is, and it's a sensitivity to air pressure. But what it means is we tend to think of the auditory and the visual sensitivity and the smell sensitivity, it can be vestibular. 
It can be proprioception, where your body is in space and all those sorts of things. So it's all the sensory systems can be affected to various degrees. Mm -hmm. So when that person, as you described, has a sensitivity to air pressure, what for other people may be just a quite a common, you know, oh yeah, there's nothing significant. For this person, it's painful. Mm -hmm. And so people need to recognize that it's genuine. The person's not being a whining person who's complaining about things. Mm -hmm. It's a genuinely aversive experience. Mm -hmm. This was asked in, in a manner before. This is from Inkspot. Um, we've had a, a, a large degree, of, we've had a lot of discussion about the difference between special interest friends and intimate friends and how from the outside an NT, looking at a relationship between an Aspergian and an NT that could look as if it's intimate is actually nothing more than a special friendship. One example would be a professor and a student where the student to some degree looks like he's, he or she is idolizing the professor, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a very platonic thing. It is, but those with Asperger's may idolize intellect, not physique. <laughs> so in other words, okay. they're not necessarily having a crush in terms of wanting a sexual relationship. They're admiring the intellect of that person. Another component is that the tendency is to assume that people are sexually orientated. Many people with Asperger's are what I call asexual. They're not interested in a sexual relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. They're interested in an intellectual relationship mm -hmm. and may be very enthusiastic and for that. But people will project onto that person that their motives are sexual. No, it's the brain I'm interested in. It's the ideas that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. not physical. That frames up her question nicely. She's wondering how to protect these people that are involved in this non-romantic special interest relationship. So it is in her best interest to say, this is my sister, the student, she is not looking at him as a sexual object, she is admiring his intellect. Oh, absolutely. And in Asperger's, intellect can be one of the most important, if not the most important, personality characteristics that you admire in people. <laughs> and so it's the intellect I'm interested in, not that person in terms of uh, a sexual relationship. And in fact, the person with Asperger's is then horrified that, that people would... But no, I'm interested in, the, in his ideas. I'm interested in, in what he says because it's so fascinating. But the degree of passion for the ideas is assumed to be a sensual, sexual passion. But it's an intellectual passion. Now, I don't know whether you're allowed to do this, but I would say it creates an intellectual orgasm. Whether you can actually put this on YouTube or, or words or that, I don't know. But, but that intellectual orgasm is so enjoyable, but it's better than an interpersonal orgasm. Well, okay. <laughs> Is that something that we try to explain to other NTs? Yes, because otherwise they'll misinterpret. The person who's the focus of this usually recognizes it's not sexual, it's not sensual, because they just sense mm -hmm. that it's the mind that's being explored. Mm -hmm. And other people think, oh, with that degree of adulation, there must be a hidden agenda. She's doing this so she can appeal to that person to get higher grades, to use a bit of the sort of strategies that can be used to tempt someone and that's not their intention. Why are we as NTs sometimes so disgusting in the conclusions we Because it, we're looking at ourselves as what we would do in that situation <laughs> and realize they're completely different motives.